All right, um, so I see that we have a quorum. We have eight, um, shortly nine. Uh, David, I don't, uh, I don't see you. I'm gonna assume you're there because I see a, I see your name. Um, all right, so I'd like to call the May 26, 2020 governing board meeting of CV Fiber to order. Um, the recording has started. Um, all right, uh, any additions or changes to the agenda? Did you want to add a discussion about um, Washington, Siobhan? Um, yeah, sure. Let's do that. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we can do that right away. Give some other folks yeah, a so chance to uh, to pop in here. Yeah. Any anything else that we need to add or change? Okay. Hearing none. Uh, public comment. Does anybody have anything to comment on that's not on the agenda? Hello, David. I, I met. See you now. Uh, this, this is John uh, Russell. Uh, I met somebody yesterday, not yesterday, two days ago, who is part of Mansfield Fiber. Mm -hmm. um, really small, I guess, only 108 or something like that connections. Um, but they got it all done. He says they got it all done in two years. So I don't know what they did. I didn't have a long conversation with them, but. So they have a hundred, a hundred um, there, and they're expanding again this summer. Yeah, they were, the, they were the first. Oh, they were? They, they were the first ones to take advantage of the Vita broadband expansion loan. And, oh. and, the, folks, and the folks that run that were actually involved in uh, EC Fiber and in Burlington Telecom. So they, the, 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 the Nultis certainly know what they're doing. Okay. So they had a bit of a head of steam, I think, going into that. Yeah. Uh, anything else, public comment, not on the agenda? Okay, let's move on to, um, well, let's, let's do a discussion of, of Washington. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Go for it. You're, you can do that, Siobhan. Okay. All right. So I've been approached a couple of times by individuals from Washington. The most recent one is Katharina, and we spoke on the phone recently. She is in the meeting right now. I see. Well, I see her name. Um, they are trying to weigh joining EC Fiber or us. Um, I explained that the process is their select board has to decide to make do, do this. Um, they had a, there were some people who had the idea that if they joined, everybody would be obligated to use CV fiber. And, and, it's, and there was another uh, kind of a, well, not really a misunderstanding. It's just um, they were told that easy fiber doesn't do wi uh, wireless, but we were going to be doing wireless. And I said, well, that, we are that's not decided at this point. We haven't made that decision, but there there may be some stationary wireless in the future somewhere, but we're not sure. It's not what we're planning at the moment. Um, and so we we had some nice conversation about all of this, and um, I think she's interested in talking to her select board about joining, and I just wanted to put it out there that it's still something we're interested in because I think we're still interested in Washington because of the, their location, right? Yeah, so so um, I guess that's it. I, I could probably go on for another five minutes not saying much new, so I won't. So, uh, Katharina, if you, if you can hear me and you're interested in weighing in or you have any questions for us, you have our undivided attention. If there's anything that we can do to help as you go to your select board and such. It looks like she's muted. She may need. Oh, oh. there she is. Okay. Hi, 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 everybody. Um, thanks for letting me listen in. Yeah. Um, I I guess Siobhan did answer most of my questions. Um, the the thing with the wireless tower. Um, 
I'm not, you know, I'm pretty tech unsavvy. I know that 10 years ago or so there was a, uh, one of my neighbors on the mountain that I live on was approached by Verizon to put up a cell tower and everybody was going screaming, no, 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 we don't want a tower. Down. So my biggest concern would be, even if it's temporary, a tower. So I guess I would have to make myself really knowledgeable about what that means, what that entails, how it impacts your health, et cetera, et cetera. And then aside from that, before I approached my select board, I wanted to talk to Siobhan because I wanted to have some good talking points on how to convince them to, you know, write that letter that they have to write um, to be accepted as a member town. I guess that's it. Yeah, and so we are, um, so I, th I think Siobhan or I would probably be happy to attend, not to volunteer you there, Siobhan, but I think you'd <laughs> oh, yeah, be happy I'm to offered. attend that meeting. Um, and, so th and so they can ask questions of us if there's something that in sort of the prepared <laughs> presentation, if you, if you didn't feel comfortable uh, asking. And I, I should clarify, if we were to use wireless, we'd be talking mm -hmm. about rather small deployments and again Siobhan's right we're not really we don't really know what that's going to look like it would not be a Verizon cell tower it would not look anything like a Verizon cell tower it would be rather rather small to hit a handful of houses at most but um, so I'm I, I am a computer scientist uh, electromagnetic uh, fields are not my area of specialty that's my sort of required PhD disclosure um, however um, as I understand it the uh, the science does not really support um, health impacts of wireless. Um, but again, mm -hmm. not not my field. I'm going to defer. I'm going to defer to people in the field. But I, it would, it, yeah, it would be worthwhile doing doing some research, looking at the literature, and finding out more about that. I think. When you say small, what does that mean? Five feet, ten feet, twenty feet high? Go ahead, Michael. Um. So what we're we're planning almost all fiber to the home, Katerina. But mm -hmm. we're, we're planning on using nothing. We're not committed to anything yet, but we're tentatively planning on using some fixed wireless to fill in where we can't easily get to with fiber early, and then eventually mm -hmm. overbuild with fiber and take the wireless out. Mm -hmm. um, there are going to be some places where there's a bunch of wireless, certain towns because there's already available towers. Um, that does not include Washington, and and the towers we're talking about aren't really towers; they're utility poles. Mm -hmm. So they're that that sort of size. In most cases, we're going to put in forty or fifty foot poles and put some antennas on those. And the spectrum that's going to be used, the the radio frequency spectrum, is going to be in the low to mid band spectrum, which is the most safe of all the frequencies. The higher the frequency, the more danger there is. And the higher the power, the more danger there is. And so we're going in the opposite direction, low power, lower frequencies. So very safe stuff. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, Any, anybody else have any thoughts about uh, Washington one way or the other, or should we just see how their select board votes and Talk about it then. Okay, I'm seeing head nod, David. <laughs> well, I mean, the one thing is we we have 18 towns that we've not delivered any yet, and EC fiber is pretty much built out. So, if I was Washington and I wanted something quicker, I might consider EC fiber. But my understanding is there's no reason why we couldn't apply to both, right? That's true. No. It's, yes. No. That, that's true. That, that that is true. But in terms of then, you know, who's going to take responsibility, and who's going to put you as a priority? I mean, if you're in both, um, it's going to be you know, not me. And then EC Fiber says not me. So, um, uh, so so no. I mean, there's nothing that precludes you from from being in both. It would just be um, ma making sure that you know that you you will have uh, your turn when it comes to being mm -hmm. being built out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm having a hard time seeing the name of the person speaking with the headphones on. I'm sorry. Yeah. Me? Yes, yes, me? yes, yes. That's, 
I, oh, I, sorry. I, yeah. Well, there's very few females, so I'm talking about the male here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm Jeremy Hansen. I'm the chair. Oh, Jeremy. So so I really appreciate you and Siobhan volunteering to speaking at the select board meeting. I have to find out first how they're meeting and when. Uh, you know, it's I'm not really connected with them, but when you say meeting with them, would that be prior to them voting or prior? Right? It would have to be prior to their voting, right? Um, we could go either way. I mean, if the select board meets, it has to be a warned meeting. So uh -huh. I'm happy. I'm happy just to go into the meeting as they're discussing it right before they mm -hmm. voted on it. I mean, that's okay. what I what we did with uh, with Chuck in Moortown and sort mm -hmm. of arm twisted arm twisted the Moortown select board a little bit and said, "No, this is something that you really ought to do." Okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we're we're happy to you know happy to do that and because uh, I've I think I've heard basically every question about uh, communications union districts and I think I have a pretty good finger okay. on the pulse of, of where things are going in the state and at the federal level. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I wanna f I'm gonna find out when they're meeting and I get in touch with you or Siobhan, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah get both like, of us. Get in touch with, yeah, that, yep. Okay, great, thank you. All right, thanks Katarina. Um, mm -hmm. Any other, uh, let's see, so that was our discussion of Washington. Uh, reports back about recent meetings. Um, so I know, uh, David, you've been in a few. Michael, you've been in a few. Uh, I'm just going to go. I don't have anything like really specific to report back. I'll just tell you the uh, meetings that I've been in, um, give you a brief overview. There was a meeting with Velco. Uh, Velco is really interested in uh, helping in any way that they can. They have a plan to, um, to do some additional fiber builds. And they would like to know and, co and cooperate if they're building in a particular place and we can sort of avoid duplication of effort. Um, they're willing to partner with us. And that could be uh, if we build the fiber and we give them some capacity, they would trade that for capacity on their network elsewhere. They said explicitly that that was something that they would uh, be willing to do. Um, had a meeting with somebody from the EDA, I think the Economic Development Agency, if I'm not mistaken. I didn't even realize that this was a federal agency. Um, there is some grant money that is coming out of that. The rep from the EDA said, um, your best bet at getting a um, getting at the funds that they put out is to get all of the CUDs together and put in one statewide application and go in together as a consortium. Um, and the other CUDs were on the call and everybody was kind of interested in that and EC Fiber sort of said, okay, well, um, we'll take that under advisement and they suggested that they might be willing to uh, kind of be that um, leader, let's say, leader um, kind of putting their name on the front of, of the consortium, but kind of exactly how that's going to work is not not totally clear yet. Um, and so David and Michael, you're, you've been in some of these meetings, so if you think I'm missing something or if you want to add anything, just, just, just pop in. I, I wasn't um, at the one about EDA, but I, I should just comment that EDA has built a lot of fiber in the state already. Part of the Berkeley's Kingdom Dark Fiber Network was built by EDA. Oh, with interesting. EDA funds. Cool. Um, the Telecom Oversight Board, which is a, a board that arguably um, it provides oversight to the uh, Public Service Department. Um, Evan Carlson, our friend up in the Northeast Kingdom, CUD, uh, he's on that board. And uh, that board met and took some comments about the emergency broadband plan. And uh, they are kind of chewing on it, but it doesn't sound like there's really much moving forward with that. I mean, obviously, correct me, Michael or David, if you think I'm misstating that, but it doesn't sound like that there's much happening on that mm -hmm. board. Uh, House, House Energy and Tech continues to be very invested in talking about this um, this topic a lot. Um, they had a rather long meeting uh, with some of the usual suspects in this in this field statewide last Friday, was it? I think it was Friday. Yep. Um, kind of trying to figure out what to put together and what to take from the emergency broadband plan and to put that into legislation. So it seemed like they were really chomping at the bit to get something going uh, soon, like sooner than later, like weeks scale, because they're going to be adjourning before too long. And I think they're going to want to get something out the door. Um, 
what else? I think that was really my list of meetings. Anything else? Anybody so have any other meetings? Yeah. There was a CUD organizing meeting of That's right. all the CUDs that I don't know whether Evan set it up or um, FX from EC Fiber set it up, but all the CUDs were on it. There, and then the fledgling, almost CUD um, areas the were on the call. Yeah. And at Addison and um, I don't know if no Franklin was not on the call. Anyway, the uh, the gist of the conversation was a couple, fold, three, fold, two fold. Anyway, the first one was was it worthwhile setting up an organization or association of CUDs? And the answer was yes, in general. And I heard, I talked to FX today from EC Fiber, and evidently uh, their lawyer Giuliani, and hopefully our lawyer Giuliani, has drafted up a proposal to do that. And we'll see that soon. The second thing that came out of that meeting, of the, the proposal anyway, was was there any interest in the CUDs getting together as a group to bid on the FCC's ADOF auction? And that EC Fiber said they would be interested in leading that um, if there was an interest. And when he when the meeting happened, he's indicated he wasn't sure that they could come up with uh, the money guarantee. But today he was much more optimistic about that. Um, so that's another possibility that's out there that needs to be acted on in the next couple of weeks. And I forgot what the third say, area. Is there, is there even time to do that? Sure. Well, okay. I don't. I, I would say yes. Well, you know me, I'll say, I'll say yes to anything, so. <laughs> um, Michael, was there one other topic of the coordinating? Because I know Jeremy had to leave. Was that the meeting that Rob Fish called? Was that yes. The one I, think it was, I think yep. it was Rob's, okay. yeah. But that was organized by the department, not by the Cubs. Yeah. Um, what else? I didn't take notes on that one. Let me thank you. Yeah, no, the other thing I think Rob Fish said that he was proposing Putting in a northern borderline, northern region, northern border region commission um, proposal for all the cuds, which struck me as I didn't follow up on what he was doing, but um, I probably should, but I haven't. I think that's all I got out of that meeting. Another meeting that I went to, I spoke on behalf of another board that I'm on for telehealth to the Energy and Technology Committee, and they're pretty intent on on doing something in the short term using the COVID. Um, $1.25 billion. We'll see if anything fl flushes out from that for their immediate broadband or Wi Fi, a, a radio WISP kind of things. But I think that was it. I don't know if I have any other meetings. Oh, I did. Oh, I did talk to the Regional Planning Commission today, and everybody should know this. They were not comfortable um, signing, an, in fact, they would not sign an NDA to get a copy of the feasibility study. Um, and Bonnie's point was, um we have to certify that what you guys do is consistent with the regional plan and without seeing the feasibility study it would be tough to do that i said oh i'm still looking for a letter of support for our grant application and she was willing to do that as long as she knew a little more detail on what well, we're going to do it on what you know how how it was going to work rather than where it was going to work she said it'd be a lot easier if she could see the plan um and i said well at this point if you don't sign the NDA, you don't get to see it. Um, so I just thought I'd pass it on to everybody. I, I don't understand her objection to signing the NDA. If if she needed to see it, what was her reason she couldn't? She didn't give me a good reason. Okay. I was I was mostly interested in getting the letter. <laughs> Get the letter. Because in, in the grant application, you have to certify that you're project is consistent with the regional plan and any state plan. And right. so that is where, you know, she's important to us. Um, even though the state, the regional plan is not very definite, not very <clears throat> articulate. I did, I've cited all the relevant pieces in, of the regional plan into the application. But, and, David, and obviously, you, oh, no, go ahead. Sorry, Jerry. sorry. David, did you reach in back into the um, USDA grant because we tapped some of that also in the USDA grant saying that we were consistent. I don't remember exactly if their, uh, if their plan was something we were consistent with, but I, I know we looked back and said, yes, we're consistent with these plans. Uh, yeah, there's a paragraph or two in the application. Yeah, and I remember that. And, and, and you know, I'm 
basically we're consistent with the plan because it's so weak. I mean, yeah, we're also consistent although, no, they're actually, there's an, interesting thing, there's an interesting thing in their plan, which is the people, they felt that broad uh, high-speed internet ought to go to villages and not to the hinterland because they're, one of their planning objectives for the region is uh, compact development. And if you bring fiber to the hinterlands, you're going to have dispersed development. So there is a little teeny bit of conflict there. She didn't think it was a big issue today because that originally was written five years ago and um, things have changed. Jeremy, you had something? Yeah, I, I was wondering if it would be worth offering to provide her with the public version of the feasibility study. She has it. Ah, okay, thanks. Oh, she has the draft version, not the not the final. I don't think we've hit. Do we have a redacted final version? I haven't done that yet. No, no I, okay. I'll, I'll be put, I'll be putting that together tomorrow. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I can, Jeremy, I could add a few things about the Belco meeting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, they some specifics. They have a hundred gigabit Ethernet middle mile backhauls. That's that's significant to offer to us. They have they would offer um, IRUs, which are long term leases. They would offer trades between our fiber and their fiber. Um, so that avoids paying money. Um, they offered their market rate would be forty five dollars a fiber strand mile, and but they said they would negotiate it lower for CUDs. Um, they'll collaborate on expansion and construction, so they'll actually work with us if we're building a project, they could be part of it. Um, I'm looking at my notes. I think there was a couple more things. Where um, is Velco again? Velco is the company that manages the whole electric grid for the state. So they're everywhere. Oh, they're the okay. transmission lines, not they're the big poles with the high voltage that doesn't go to houses. They go okay. to substations and power all the utilities. And they're owned by all the utilities and a couple of okay. other small entities. So they they don't own the utilities, the utilities own them. Um, they have 72 fibers on their on their network and 60 of them are accounted for. So they have one tube or 12 fibers left to share. And the purpose we would put them to is backhaul where we only need a couple fibers. So that's no problem for us. That's just a good thing. And, and oh, the last thing is that they are sort of organizing all the utilities into considering the possibility of also bidding in RDOF um, and building the fiber themselves putting it on their, all their poles, and then we get an operator and, and operate off, off of their leased fiber. So even though we're planning it one way, everything could change if in a year or, yeah, in about a year, depending on who owns what after the auctions, whether we have a state auction or not and this federal auction. So that's it from that meeting. Okay. Uh, any other recent meetings folks want to report back on? All right. Um, I see the next <clears throat> the next one we have here is update discussion about private fundraising and loans. That was something that Phil was going to give us a, some feedback on, and I just exchanged some emails with him before the meeting. Are you on the I'm, call, Phil? I am. I I couldn't get in for uh, the video um, call, so I'm. I'm I'm here by phone. It probably has to do with our stellar internet here in uh, <laughs> Middlesex. Uh, but um, yeah, I I had a long conversation with Stan uh, Williams, uh, and um, it was interesting. I you know primarily was talking with him about doing the you know high interest rate, high risk uh, kind of notes that we had talked about in terms of raising some matching capital for and he um, was of the opinion that we shouldn't do that 
um, at least not right now. Uh, he felt that there's a lot of money around and that we probably would not need to do that step like they did uh, because there are going to be uh, other sources of funding um, and some of it just outright grants that we wouldn't have to pay back and that rather than going that route um, of having to sell those notes, if you will, um, and pay that debt service that if we don't need to do that, then we should um that you know and i and i i take that for you know what it's worth i think he he's following this stuff very very closely um uh, as as we all are but with uh, a lot of experience under the belt he's also looking at that and how certainly for ec fiber what they can leverage and how they can move forward so you know his sense was that that when they did this the playing field looked very, very different. And it was necessary for them to do this. And this was prior to any of the, the CUD legislation. Uh, and certainly nothing like what's going on right now in this uh, COVID-19 environment and the money that's being um, either put out there or being proposed to be out there to fund the kind of work that we're doing. So. Um, that being said, whether we decide to go forward or not um, with this kind of offering, he did send me the um, agreement for this kind of uh, funding, which I've looked at, uh, I guess also was written by Paul Giuliani. Um, the piece that you had sent me, Jeremy, was for a bond issue, much, much more complex okay. um, and not something we would need to do. So so Stan sent me the language, uh, you know, it could be very easily edited uh, for us to go out. And he said, and because, you know, this is basically a, a local kind of offering, it's not like you need a broker, you don't need a financial advisor, um, you know, make the changes, have, have Paul look at it, make sure he still feels it looks okay and then go out and try to sell notes. And they did that in, in $2,500 increments. Um, and probably that, you know, less than that is probably just not worth the paperwork um, as far as, as doing this. But um, I was, I was a little surprised um, about his take on that, that just in terms of the current environment, it was much more of a wait and see than rushing into um, going this route. So that pretty much summarizes the discussion and you know where we, you know, uh, where we could be uh, and what we need to have for discussion about whether or not to proceed or do as as Stan is suggesting, which is maybe just keep this on a back burner and see what happens with other funds. Shivani, you have a question? And then Chuck? Yeah, I just wanted to double check. As a municipality, we are allowed to do a bond issue, but we probably wouldn't be able to do that until we've got some fiscal history. Am I remembering correctly? Okay, that's Three all Three years. Correct. Yep. I just wanted to double check that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, he, and we talked about that. And of course, this wouldn't be a bond issue. This is just you know short, short term, high risk, high interest rate money. Uh, Chuck and um, David. Yeah, so to, to follow up on that, um, I had a conversation uh, with Louisa Shibley, who Michael, you'll probably remember, uh, over at Milk Money, and, and um, they are actually mm -hmm. starting an offering where they will manage the loan process because apparently there is there are some reporting requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and you know it's similar to their offering where all marketing of the product it still falls on you and, mm -hmm. and if you can't successfully market it so you know too bad um but uh it's an upfront cost of twenty five hundred dollars uh to start it and then uh they have a small ongoing fee depending on how long you you continue to sell them um and they have their very first loan offering coming online uh, as we speak 
Um, so uh, that's that's the first item. If we did want to go mm -hmm. down this route, it could help with the reporting requirements that that uh, exist within the, the regulations. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is, I had a conversation with Simeon Chapin at uh, VSCCU. He's their uh, community outreach officer and, and specifically helps organizations such as ours um, figure out different funding paths. Um, and he mentioned, he, he, he can't guarantee this will be a possibility just yet, but he mentioned that in the past, they have set up situations where they basically create a CD product that is tailored to help with funding. And, and the way it works is uh, they sell the CD, it's their name on it, but it's it would be the uh, CV Fiber VSCCU CD. And anybody who actually purchases that CD, the funds get then offered to us as a loan from VSCCU. Now, obviously, our sure. risk profile is uh, uh, non-existent, <laughs> so um, <laughs> they, they need to they need to talk amongst themselves about how they would offset that risk and, and whether that would even be a possibility. Um, but that conversation is in flight. Um, and then the, the last thing I wanted to point out is I'm having a meeting on Friday with Chelsea Lewis, who helps manage the Vermont Community Foundation, uh, which is a fund located over in Middlebury that funds lots of different co-ops and, and municipal interests. Um, and so I'll report back, obviously, what uh, what I might find as to whether there, there are any opportunities there. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, and uh, sorry, one, one last thing. Louisa Shibley um, mentions we should also get in touch with an attorney located in Burlington named Eli Moulton. I don't know if anybody knows this person, but he apparently is specifically uh, well versed in helping organizations figure out different fundraising techniques. Okay. okay. Eli Moulton, you said? That's right. Yeah, he, right. he, so I was just confirming the name. Yeah, Eli Mole. Okay. Um, yeah, the one, the one other thing that um, I forgot to to report on that was interesting when when I was talking with Stan is that I I had asked him if he had any recommendations about financial advisors because you know Paul Giuliani had recommended that we try to find someone and I not had any luck and Stan's comment was well great if you find one let me know. <laughs> because as far as I know, yeah, right, right, as well. If you don't know one at this point in the game, then I'm, you know, <laughs> there's, there's no chance I'm finding one. He said, as far as he knows, there is nobody in the state of Vermont that has a, enough experience or knowledge about the telecommunications industry to basically give us any help. So we're... <laughs> He was basically like, you know, we're all on our own. He goes, it was like, you know, I'd love to find somebody too, but I can't find anybody. So um, I'm, I'm not sure where. The, I, I'm going to call Paul back at one of these places. Go, okay, you you suggested this. Find me the person, but because uh, you know, none of us seem to know one. So. All right. Uh, thanks for uh, yeah. Thanks for all that research, Chuck. It sounds like you got some pretty promising options there. Yeah. Uh, I have David, David, and I think Siobhan, you have your hand up again. Yeah. No, Chuck covered everything that I was going to talk about, so that's good. No, not okay. everything. He covered more. <laughs> okay, Michael. Um, I'm trying to remember what I wanted to say. Oh, we'll go backwards. Uh, Eli Moulton is is my attorney. He's wonderful, um, and he managed he managed my with my offering as well as setting up my company. Um, and I, I do endorse Smooth Money as a, as a great platform for if we're going to do incremental investing like, like we've been thinking about. But I agree with Stan, and I think I've been saying this earlier. Um, that's what we do if we have to do it, in my opinion. I think if we yeah. can get this NBRC grant, we're going to have the match that we need, and we're going to be able to get the Vita money, and we're not going to have to load all these loans at high interest and manage them and buy them back when we get low interest bonds, which is what EC Fiber was forced to do. But right. one thing different about the environment is the Vita thing, which EC Fiber didn't have available to them. And and if we can get an NBRC grant to to be the match for that, we don't really have to raise funds. So. 
let's not even do it until we know. But if but if we start yeah. getting hints from from Ken Jones and and others at ACCD that the the policy is saying, oh, you can get your money somewhere else. We're not going to give broadband money out. If we hear that, well, then we need to start scrambling. And maybe we're going to look at that investment vehicle again. Um, what was the other thing I wanted to say? I don't know if I can. Well, I guess that's that covers it. That's good. Go on. Thank you. Okay. Any other uh, questions or thoughts about uh, private fundraising, high interest rate loans out to folks? Is is the consensus that uh, I see you, Siobhan. So the consensus I'm kind of hearing, or at least the silent consensus, is that maybe we just hold on now, see if, and have let Chuck continue to talk to folks, um, and then maybe engage one of those processes in parallel if we need to. But Siobhan, what do you think? I was just going to say that I'm in favor of not going into debt. That's just how I live my life. So, yeah, no debt. So that's that's my advice. I don't talk to teenagers much, and so when I do, I'm like crazy Aunt Siobhan, and I say, "Stay out of debt." That's that's so, my that's my catchphrase. But, so no Vita either, right? <laughs> no, Oops. no, no. Okay, that's only a four million dollar debt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the high interest stuff. The high interest stuff. Yeah. Credit cards versus a mortgage. Well, Vita's okay. not low, but. It might be necessary. But, yeah. Well, when, again, when, when talking with Stan, he said, you know, you might, you know, do the Vita thing initially, although, like you were just saying, it's, it's not real high, it's not real low, it's somewhere in the middle. But you do that until you get some track history and then until you can float some, some bonds if you need to and then pay off the Vita debt, um, which seems to make sense to me. Well, I, I think that's actually how the Vita loans are structured, was intending for, that oh, to be, okay. to, to, for the uh, revenue bonds to be the off-ramp, because it's, it's not, they're not going to hold those, um, they're not going to hold those loans for the duration, as, as I understand. Okay. It. If, if somebody so they're fairly short the, term, too. Yeah, yeah okay. I, I, th I, I think the payments are, are spread out over, was it 20 years or something like that, but the, the idea is mm -hmm. that we then pay back into them where we essentially buy them out with uh, municipal bonds when we can get to that point. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Okay. Anything else on fundraising loans, et cetera? Okay. Let's move on. Um, next thing, uh, RDOF partnerships. David, you want to drive this one? Based on our last meeting, I sent out the, uh, another email with uh, the criteria list of things we needed to have answered before we took on a partner. And I included an NDA for the feasibility study. And so far, I have not had a reply from any of them. They, had, they have another week or two to respond. Um, but nobody took me up on the NDA. Uh, Valiant did. And oh yeah, well that, that's a little slightly different, isn't it? Wasn't you going to work with Stan? That too, but I mean they're also they're also using that in their in their response. I okay. Thought. Oh, okay, fine. So that I didn't know. Thank you. And didn't Vito, David? And, and Vito, which I'm not still trying to figure out. Yes, Vito's got some complicated that I need to reconnoiter with a bunch of people to figure out what to do with Vito. Mm -hmm. So okay, that's still a work in progress. The other one, oh, I did, I mean, I talked to Washington Electric Co-op and they're still mulling it over. <laughs> a lot of cooks in the I mean, kitchen. I, right in now. a positive direction, but they're certainly really slow to, I mean, they're really accounting on that feasibility study to tell them what to do. Well, by then the ship has already left. So, um, and and the other thing that was disappointing about Washington Electric Co-op, they did not meet with the consortium of electric utilities to talk about this. So I don't know what that meant. Um, so so that's a, that's the update on that. I yeah may have to um, this day this twenty sixth. 
if we need to do something before the next meeting, I'll let you know. I don't I don't believe we will. Okay. Um, what, one question I want to kind of put out, out to the board, we've been talking about this sort of offhandedly. Um, what's the general feeling about going at going at the ARDA funds with a statewide CUD consortium. We get all the CUDs together and we create a super CUD, maybe a special organization created you know, with the legislature's help or something like that, uh, or something on our own, you know, legally crafted by uh, Paul Giuliani or whatever, um, and going after the ARDA funds on a statewide basis with all of the CUDs linking arms. Any thoughts about that? Siobhan? It it seems like a good idea because that is, it's a bigger pool of power or we're better together than we are individually. It seems yeah. it's less we're competing against each other and more working together. And so obviously I'm for that. Yeah. So this is Phil. I, I, I agree with Siobhan that I think the the bigger the consortium, the more power we yield. So yeah, I'm I'm in favor of it. Michael, then Greg. I know M Michael, you you have some uh, there's some nuance here. Yeah, um, I don't think being bigger is any better in our doc. Um, what is valuable about this is that ValleyNet has bidding rights. So everybody consorting with them in a consortium gets bidding rights that way. That's the valuable thing about this. And I think it is something to consider. Uh, I don't think it's a slam dunk, but I think we should really be open to it. Um, whoever is the lead bidder has to get the letter of credit to cover the whole thing. So if they're doing the whole state, it's an enormous letter of credit. Whoever is the lead bidder is going to be response, has to become an eligible telecommunications carrier, which is a state definite, it's a federal, definition, but run by states, uh, you become carrier of last resort and all kinds of other obligations. And whoever is the lead bidder is responsible for getting all the build out done. So that's asking ValleyNet to take on an enormous responsibility. If they're willing to do it, we should keep talking to them about it. But being big doesn't make any difference because you still have to bid on all the individual block groups and it's just a matter of how much you're going to bid. It doesn't matter if you're big or small. Everyone has an equal footing in that sense. All right, Greg. Yeah, so uh, I agree with Michael, and it's really the ladder of credit. So, but that may be if all the CUDs were to come together in a consortium, that might be something that the state or VITA could arrange for that letter of credit. And that's something that we've been explicitly talking about and the state and n nobody's running screaming saying that they wouldn't do that which is i think not a great sign but at least you know something that's that could be talked about i mean that could be feasible it's in the state plan <laughs> yeah in the, in the emergency plan yeah yeah jeremy this um, is jerry can i yeah. can i get in Absolutely. Yeah, I'm 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 a little bit concerned about doing doing that and following up on what Michael just discussed. It's it's an incredible financial commitment uh, to make something happen, and we've got nascent CUDs and you know really it's 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 EC fiber with the track record. We're doing pretty well for ourselves, but you know, we haven't turned the lights on for anybody yet and other CUDs are even farther behind, it, it would be quite an extraordinary commitment uh, to, to say that, that we would follow up on, on the statewide um, uh, areas. I, I'm, I'm not sure we're ready to make that or even be a part of that kind of commitment. That's all. So, so but, but re realistically it would be ValleyNet taking on the risk so i mean I, so what would be the, the the drawback in your eyes what would be the thing that would make you feel better about joining something like this i i, I guess to put it from my perspective i i don't see how ValleyNet would reasonably take on that kind of risk that that's that's an extraordinary risk for them to take on 
Well, so but there wouldn't be any financial risk there, really, because the letter of credit would be insulating them somewhat from that. I mean, there there still is obviously risk, but in terms of you know them lo losing the farm, the the state it would be essentially un underwriting that and sort of eating some some of that risk for them. So we, I I'll, I'll chime in on that when the floor is open. Yeah, go for it. I, I, my concern there would be, you know, we, we have to worry about the implementation capability too. And single provider value now is pretty small. They've already showed a reluctance for some diversion of technology. And so if you're throwing the whole boat in on one provider, I, I'd be a little wary of that. That's all. Okay. And any other thoughts, David? Yeah, this, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not opposed to the idea. But it's sort of a complicated uh, map out there. You know, Washington Electric thinking it might or may not. My feeling is they're not going to get it together in time. Um, and then we have ValleyNet, and I haven't heard back from you know the other ISPs that I sent out the interest to. So it's an interesting. I mean, the Valley the ValleyNet one is interesting. So. All right. Last call on uh, Ardoff stuff. All right, moving along. We are a bit ahead of schedule, like to see that. Uh, approval of the NBRC, NBRC application. So uh, you would have seen a message from David earlier today that includes- <laughs> 15 the, minutes ago. Yeah, that's right. So the application for um, the Northern Borders Regional Commission grant um which i what was the actual so we're at we're requesting about six hundred thousand dollars to right. cover the ma the match and some other stuff for the uh for the pilot project in conjunction with the vita loan this is sort of have this been our uh kind of plan all along um and an incredible amount of work i admit i've not more than sort of, sort of superficially skimmed it um but the amount of work that David put into this is uh, impressive. Um, not, not to mention when you see that, how, how many pages did you say it's gonna be with all of the addenda? Hundred? Oh, well, probably a couple hundred. But the, um, the one question I have for the group, uh, let's see, question, question. Mm, well, right now, I mean, I'm gonna have 28 page, uh, 35 pages of letters of support. Uh, in doing this, I mean, I use the feasibility study pretty much extensively to come up with the numbers, and and then I added our own, you know, potential labor to do, work on this. Um, I'm going to ask. I mean, right now I'm still working on it because actually the whole application has to be done online, and I was tired of going in and out, so I just created a Word document that matches the application document. Then, in addition to the the budget uh, worksheet. It's actually a spreadsheet. If somebody wanted the spreadsheet, I can send you the spreadsheet. Um, the um, there's two other forms they require to be submitted at the same time. One is a standard federal 420, 424. I forget the name. Anyway, we've seen it before with our other federal grant applications, and I have to admit that I'm I'm encouraged by the amount of work that's gone into this, only because I think we can use this for a bunch of other other federal applications and maybe even the EDA one. Oh, that'd be good. Because it, it summarizes a lot of what we're doing. I, I'm not exactly sure what the EDA proposal might end up being, but at least the uh, the heavy lifting in terms of filling in forms, getting all the names right and all that is done. So the application needs to be in their hands on June 1st, which is next Monday. I will finish my piece of it, pending anybody's comments tomorrow or the next, by Thursday. Um, I can make, I'll keep on making changes then, and then I have to put it into the onto the web version. So I'd like that's why Thursday is my drop dead date. Um, and I don't think I have anything else. Um, they have some restrictions on how long sections can be. So you'll notice that I could have gone on for pages about what we were doing, but they didn't want that. They wanted 500 words. Um, so. I, and I have a question into Christy at, at the department, the, the woman from the state who's overlooking this thing. 
about the feasibility study being included with the application because they're a public organization. So the question is, is whether anything that I, tr if, if we can say that this is proprietary, not for release, or does it have to be redacted? I have that question into her and I'll get an answer on that because I mean, without the feasibility study, they don't even know what we're doing. So I have, <laughs> it'd be tough, tough to, um, not have it in there, but at the same time, I'll, 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 I'm quite aware of the issue of they are a federal organization, so subject to public records review as well. But my guess is they've dealt with this before because they often finance publicly uh, private ventures with the money. So I'll, I'll see what she says when she sends it back. Anyway, so that's okay. sort of thing. I'll be happy to take any questions or suggestions. By the way, I want to thank everybody for the outreach that you've done. Uh, I forgot on the list tonight, Senator Cummings is putting together a letter from all three senators from Washington County. <clears throat> and I hopefully get that tomorrow. Um, Alan, thank you. Avram's letter came today. So that was super. And David, I don't know who, you are, Phil, are you getting all the people from the list? From, you should be getting a letter from Tim Newcomb, which is really pretty interesting, the situation he's in. Uh, I've seen it, and he said he's sending it on to you, so you can add that to the pending list. I forgot to add that to the list, yeah. Okay. You no, know, uh, people are coming out of the woodwork in Middlesex and Worcester, so either Phil or you have done an amazing job. Phil, is that you doing that? I'm sorry, I was on, on mute. No, actually, Lori Sharp took that on. And, All right. uh, you know, offered, offered to help uh, do that, and I said, sure, run with it, uh, you know. And so, yeah, Lori's done a great job making connections, and I just handled the select board, and he did all the others. Okay, and then Chuck is phenomenal. <laughs> anyway, everybody, everybody's contributed, so it's great. Andy, get a couple from you. That's great. And, yeah, that's the funny thing is I get these things, and I don't know who they came from. I don't know who, who got the people to submit to them. <laughs> All right. Well, so um, what we're hoping to do tonight is, uh, as a board, approve or uh, essentially uh, empower David and I to submit the online application for the NBRC grant with the materials that he's putting together. So David's preparing it and is, is essentially the technical contact. I'm the admin contact who has to actually go into the computer system because I'm the chair and I have to go click submit. Um, essentially authorize it. So I'm going to move that we authorize David and I to submit the NBRC grant application. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. Let's see if we can do this consensus thing again. I'm going to unmute John. Um, and if I don't hear any objections, I will assume that we have consensus. Make sure if you're muted and you have something to say, you unmute. Wait a moment. Hearing no objections, I'm going to assume that we have consensus and the motion passes unanimously. Thanks, everybody. Um, okay, let's move on to next steps after feasibility study. Uh, the feasibility study was submitted to the department. I sent a message to Clay today, hoping to hear back, um, if, you know, any little tidbit of information. Um, it says 10 days to review. We're at, um, I think we're at seven or seven days. We, we have another two or three days anyways before they're supposed to respond and give us essentially the green light to go forward um, with the business planning part. Uh, as far as I know, Fred is not waiting for that. Um, is not waiting for that green light. I think he's basically um, assumed that we're going to get it. But I don't know that uh, uh, David, project team folks, you guys haven't had like another formal meeting with him since the final deliverables. No, I emailed him tonight to get an update to do that. So, well, okay. I'll send out an update to everybody later. Okay. So next steps after the feasibility study are going to be the um, business plan, which um, reconnected with Stan at Valley Net. He's uh, re you know recommitted to doing some of those financial bits and pieces. 
um, which will also allow us to tap more of the USDA funding for the remainder of, of the project. Um, the timeline um, uh, is also mentioned in David's um, uh, NBRC application that he's put together. So looking at when we would be preparing for you know, RFPs for engineering, system design, construction, how all that's supposed to be working out. Um, so it's in there. Um, what's the, um, do you know when the turnaround time, when we would know if we got the, the NBRC funds, David? Uh, the original application package said August, so my guess would be around early September. Okay, so the yeah. idea is that we would then essentially have our Vita loan be, being ready to right. pull, the, pull the trigger pending that, yeah? So I pulled down the Vita application, which is online now, and Jeremy, I don't know if you've got a good relationship with the woman there that does it. It's like, they, it's their standard application, and the top they just titled it broadband, blah, 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 blah. I mean, they're asking for stuff that we don't have. I mean, it's so, and I don't know what the lead time is for the application, do you? Um, no, I mean, it's it's not super fast, but I, I don't think it's terribly slow either. I mean, I can um, I can ask Yoon Young and see what she, what she says in terms of, you know, if there are specific things that you found in there that you wanna highlight that's, you know, not, that just don't apply yeah. to our project. Um, I think you know, in a lot of cases, if it doesn't apply, we just put you know NA, and yeah. we can ask about we'll, it. We'll have a lot of that. I mean, the one thing they need is a business plan. <laughs> well, so, so good, we'll have good news for yeah, good news for us is that that's that's why we're building this, right? Yeah. So so we should cool. hopefully be able to just kind of drop that down as part of the application, uh, and go from there. So, uh, any other thoughts or questions about uh, process now that that uh, now that we're sort of waiting on the Department of Public Service? Okay. So uh, let's move on. We might be done much more quickly than than I thought. Um, update on the public records requests. Um, so I received the public records request we talked about at the last meeting. Um, that. Um, my denial um, with the redaction was appealed to the head of the agency, which um, interestingly enough is me. So I spent some time, um, I read, reread over the statutes. Um, Did came, you have a meeting with yourself? Uh, in, in a way, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 did, I didn't take minutes if that's what you were hoping, but, <laughs> um, which would be a public record, but. Um, but no, so I, I reviewed the statutes and I sort of um, you know, gave it gave it some more thought and came to the same place that you know we are a uh, kind of in this odd position of being both a public and a competitive entity, and that the statute seems to support uh, a competitive entity having trade secrets. So based on that, I sent the response, and uh, yeah sent that response and uh, I have not heard back since. So the next step would be uh, if the requester decided that um, that they wanted to uh, um, proceed from there, if they weren't satisfied with, with my response, it would then be um, sent up to the uh, Superior Court, Washington County, for them to adjudicate. And so- How much that, time do they have before they have to do that filing? I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know that there is a, um, I, I don't know that window. Do you know Alan offhand? Like no, how I, fast they have to? I don't know. I mean, I, it could be as much as six months, but I can check that and I can send you a note, Jeremy, about that. When, can you tell me when you actually sent the, um, sent the denial of the appeal? Do you remember the date of that? Yeah, stand by. I sent the denial of the appeal Wednesday, May 20th. Okay. Before you know, the, the end of the business day. So the first thing the person who's been denied has to decide, decides if they're going to get a lawyer or represent themselves, and in this case, the person might represent himself. They have to decide if they really do want to file, and there's a filing fee that used to be, 
I don't know, $275. It's probably gone up since then. Um, <clears throat> so the person has to think, is it really worth it to me? Um, so I, I'll, I'll look to see how long he has, and I'll send it to you, Jeremy, and you can decide if you want to distribute it further or not. Okay. I appreciate it. Yeah, good um, work on this. I appreciate you doing you. all this. Um, and uh, as an update, I received another request for the same document from a different party. Um, I suspect my, my response will be uh, somewhat the same. Um, I have not read in detail uh, that that request I saw it was just like just today, like within the last several hours. I saw that it was there. I glanced at it, and I I'll, I'll get back to it and send a response probably tomorrow. So we have to do a redaction of the final version then. That's what I'm doing it tomorrow. Okay, um, and I would also ask um, members of the board who have unredacted copies. Um, I would. Think hard about the wisdom of passing along um, the unredacted copies to anyone outside of the board. You're not really within your rights to do so. I mean, just just saying. Um, so if anybody has any questions or any anything else about this, um, Jeremy. Um, yep. When you redact the final form, remove that one map that didn't make the cut last time. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is John uh, Russell. I just, I'm just curious. Are there the two people that have asked for a copy of this? Are they potential competitors, or are they news organizations, or what? Um, or I, I, I'm happy to talk to you more about this off offline, John. They're separate from the from the meeting. Um, so when when somebody makes a public records request, we're it's not actually material um, their status or why they're requesting it. I mean, I'm 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 happy to talk to you, you know, one on one about the requesters, but I'm not going to. Um, uh, I'm I'm only curious. I'm not. Yeah. yeah if, so if if you would give me a call sometime tomorrow, I'll I'll be happy. We can chat about this more. Uh, Jeremy. Yeah. Josh. Uh, are you? Planning on sending a version of the final draft that's redacted um, out so that um, the rest of the members of the board have a copy of that? Or is it something that if we need, we can just request it at that time? I, 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 can, I can send it out to you. That's, that's no problem at all. I will, uh, um, while I'm doing the redaction, I'll, I'll, send, I'll send everybody both copies. So if you get a public request, um, the redacted copy, I think, unless anybody has any sort of objections, the redacted copy, I mean, could conceivably go on the website. Do we want to do that? Does that make sense? Or do we want to just wait until we get a request for it? Okay, so I'm going to go with gut instinct that we just want to hold on to it unless it's requested. I mean, the, the it is just a deliverable for the purposes of the broadband um, improvement grant. So. That's a, a step towards us getting the Vita loan. Did you have something, Siobhan? I think I felt like I cut you off. No? Nope. Okay. Jeremy? Um, just a thought. I'm, I'm wondering if Ardoff comes back and says that the, re that the redacted version isn't acceptable and that they can't sign an NDA, then what? So for RDOF, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, does RDOF require the feasibility study? Or I'm sorry, no, I, I, meant, I meant NRBC. Which was that? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I meant Northern Borders, not RDOF. I, I misspoke if I said. My guess is they've dealt with this in the past, and um, we'll do what's, um, what's proper, I guess. I'm not sure. Michael, do you have a thought on this? Uh, if they require it, we submit it, and we beg them yeah. to keep it proprietary. I mean, when you sent in your grant for Crasper, you had all the routes mapped. Yeah, but that <laughs> was just, that was so little. It wasn't, you know. All right, all right. I'm just, just wanted to question, Chuck. You did it. <laughs> Thank you. 
do we but, need right, to let authorize me this, them? Let me say this to everybody. When we did our NVRC grant, there were at least four people working on that application. David did this by himself. Yes, very much so. Hey, thank, thank goodness for retirement, right, Alan? <laughs> How's that working out for you? Jeez. <laughs> I'm, I'm having a ball. Good, good. You, you choose your own projects now, right? That's right. Um, so I guess, at, does the board need to authorize it, David, if necessary, yeah. to, 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 to release it now? Or what do we do with that? Good to, if, to release it as, as part of the NBRC application, you mean? If, if yes, yeah, so if Northern Borders will not accept the redacted version, can we say that David has that that at that point, it's, I mean, I, my feeling is that it's worth it to get the Northern Borders money to make this a public document. I, I think that the benefit of getting the Northern Borders money outweighs the risk that we would be at of making this a public document. My my sense they've dealt with this before and I think they'd probably keep it confidential. What do you think, Michael? I agree. I don't I don't think there's too much risk. But we should ask them just you already yeah. did ask them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah She's and, on I, I think we want to be careful with this. We have to be consistent across across the board, you know, an individual a company, an yeah. organization, an entity or whatnot. Uh, we can't pick the people that we give it to. It could be that Northern Borders will sign an NDA, you know, it, it, as David says, they've dealt with this before. Maybe that's how they deal with it. I'm not sure, but um, we do have to treat people consistently. As uh, yeah. not doing Good point. That. Just to Jeremy's point, do we need a motion on the table uh, to explicitly give David that authorization to to release it in its unredacted form if if it comes to that? Um, maybe. I mean, so I mean, I, I think I I think if the expectation is if they're going to keep it if they're going to keep it um, uh, protected. You know, if they've dealt with this before, if they're going to keep it protected, then uh, I think that there's not really any additional authorization required because that's effectively an NDA. Um, mm. But should we? So the question I think then is, should we? If they won't, should we authorize David to release it in any event for the, the greater good of the application? Greg. Uh, it could be that if it's submitted as part of the application, it's not a release. So it, it so that needs to be clarified. We're not releasing it as a standalone. It's included with an application that may be required. So, so that clarification, I think we should determine. Okay, Michael. Another possibility is that. We just include a map of the the basic pilot, the whichever the blue one or whatever it was, and not the whole report. Whatever it, whatever minimum information they need, they don't need the hundred page report. They need certain information, and we may be able to just provide the yep. certain information they need. And then now we're not being inconsistent because we're not releasing the study. Okay. So let me get an answer from her too. Yeah. So so maybe we authorize David to release the portions of this of the study that would that would be that are required for a successful application. Okay, I'm gonna move that. So we are still talking. Mean, so we're kind of modifying the other, the previous motion. Um, didn't we already pass the previous motion? So this is a motion to modify the previous okay. one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. That yes, you're right. Oh, we did. Sure. Okay. So this is an additional authorization for for David to release those portions of the study as necessary to uh, sure, submit the grant. And 
Do I hear a I'll second? I'll second that. Can I, can I amend that slightly? Um, sure, why not? So, so, we're, so we first authorized to release the whole thing. Now we're moving to release only those parts that are required. Can we make this motion in lieu of the prior moved article or whatever you say that? Uh, well, well the, 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 prior the, one, the prior one was just to authorize Jeremy Hansen and David Healy to submit the application. Oh, so application. Oh, right. But it, nothing, there's nothing about the feasibility study in there, which is why I brought it up. Oh, good. Okay. So then, yeah, I second it. Let's move. Let's discuss it if necessary. Okay. Any any thoughts on this? Um, this is John. I'm just curious. You know, as Alan points out, that we have to be consistent. Um, if indeed they will sort of accept this as an application or a portion of, of our application um, and not release any information, that's that's one thing. But if they don't accept it that way, then we would have to go against your decision, Jeremy, not to release it except as redacted. So they would, whoever those two people are, would be able to get the portion that are included in the uh, in the application itself so i think we need to we either believe in you and i do uh jeremy that we shouldn't be giving this information out because the blue line is pretty specific and anybody with um knowledge you know of of what what we're trying to do would figure out that, oh, that's where the money is. They've already discovered that's where the money is. Or, and then we are automatically being, you know, competed against um, because we gave out that information. And that's basically all the information that, that they need because everything else is, is just like add on. Okay, we did that. Now we can do these other things. So if whoever it is, they would they would have all the information that's important. That's 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 my point. Yeah, Jeremy. I mean, I guess I'm not sure that I agree with that because I mean we, we need to make the information public at some point when we make the plans. And I, I think we've already decided that you know we can make stuff public as we need, but you know what discussion of the other routes I, I i don't know i mean it, it the, the shorter the time period between when we build and when we release the information limits how much sort of mischief someone could get up to if they were trying to be a pain in the neck for us i guess is the way that i look at it whereas if someone really wanted to be a pain in the neck in some of these other locations that are maybe closer to the top of our list, you know, are, are higher up, but not at the top, then, you know, it would give them more time to do that. So if, hopefully that makes sense. Alan? Yeah, Jeremy, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe we're talking about a problem that doesn't exist here. Right. And, and maybe if, you know, David can do some poking around and, and when, when he gets closer to actually filing, we'll know what the answer is, whether there is a problem. Is there a process by which the executive committee uh, could be delegated to make a decision, the kind of decision we're talking about, rather than having the whole board do it in in the well, interim that's, between it's, a That's essentially what we're doing right now. We're just delegating that authority to David. <laughs> so, I mean, if, if, if you wanted to make it, you know, a, a, project team or executive committee or any subset of us, we, we can always delegate authority. The one thing I want to point I, out, I mean, the only, the only way this document could ever be made public is if they give us the grant. If I'm mistaken, all applications are private. I mean, when we submitted our grant application to the Department of Public Service, nobody can get a copy of our uh, proposal if we didn't win. So I don't know if the, I mean, it's another question I'll ask Christy on Wednesday. Yeah, the, the, the somewhat complicating thing here, I think, is that the, uh, 
Northern Border Regional Commission is itself a public entity, I believe. I mean, it's described as a public-private endeavor, but I think somebody could actually make the public records request of them, and they would have to deal with the same questions we've been dealing with. I don't but think I, they're public-private. I think they're a government agency. They're yeah, they are. I, yeah, I think so, too. <laughs> But I know that the you know the Department of Public any when you file a, when you make a proposal to the state government, you didn't get you don't get the award. The your document is not made public. The yeah, only document the only document that gets made public is the contract. Yeah, that makes sense to me. This is a federal agency. I I think Michael's right about that, and I don't know what the access to public records law FOIA is. In, on the federal side about what, you know, what kind of protections. Yeah. Uh, well, it, let me it, get it cleared it, on Wednesday and, and we'll. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. They have to have dealt with this many times before <clears> and <throat> and they're not going to, they're not going to release information that is proprietary and really is a trade secret. I, I, I think they'll act responsibly. Just as an aside. That things that... better or worse? That makes things better or worse, Jeremy. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to muddy the water. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, no I, I think just m making sure everybody's clear. I mean, the, the again, what we're talking about is authorizing David to choose which parts of the feasibility study, which could mean the whole thing. I mean, if that if that makes sense, uh, we're authorizing him to make that determination. He's the one that's been sitting with this for uh, months, weeks, months now and he's going to know how best to respond to this. And maybe we have, he and I have philosophical differences about um, you know, whether it should have been released in its entirety or, or not, but I'm gonna trust that he's gonna get the answer and we'll be able to act nimbly to include, include the portions that are necessary. I'm gonna, and I muted you, Phil, that was your, your feedback. Um, um, Jerry, that he's gonna I, do the right thing. I, I think a complicating factor is the law requires an agency to appoint somebody the holder of records of that agency, and that is the contact person for the public or whoever else wants to get a copy of the record to get in touch with when they do want to have a copy of, of, of what, what they say is a public document. So I'm a little bit worried about David also essentially being made a holder of the record as well when we've essentially kind of designated you as the holder of records for um, CV fiber simply because of what you've already done. You're the conduit through which these things are supposed to go, partly so there is consistency as to how the law is carried out. Okay, so are, are you suggesting that you, that D David answer these questions and that I decide? Is that what I'm hearing? Well, well you are, you're the one that's pushing the button. <laughs> okay, that's that's true. that's true. That's true. In the end, you're going to have to sign. So I I guess that's a good yeah. point. That's why I was thinking of the executive committee because it would include you and you. But this, the same thing is going to happen. What David just said, you're going to have to push the button by signing it. So you're the one who's the ultimate decision maker. That should be fine. But but that's I mean, that's honestly a bit more responsibility than I want to have. I would like the board to be able to no, I understand. But I, I I would like the board to be able to tell me that it's okay for me to do this. I do not want to go rogue and just do something because I personally myself feel like it's the right thing to do. So if I hear the board tell me to do one thing and I have a feeling to do the other, other the democratic process requires me to obey the wishes of the board. So um, Michael, then Jeremy. Um, my point got made already, but in answer to that question, um, you could have the ultimate authority and it, we can as a board recommend that if you have any questions in your mind as to the right decision, you can run it by whatever body we choose now. It could be the project team, it could be the whole board, it could be the business committee, it could be the executive committee, but is, I think we should give you the power to push the button with whatever portions of the feasibility study David believes are required. And you're making the decision as the holder of the records. And if you have 
questions about if there's some judgment calls that you're at all uncomfortable with, we should name the body you should consult with. Is that an okay. amendment to the motion? <laughs> well, we can make it shorter, but yeah, I guess. Yeah, why, why, so, so why don't you make that shorter? So right now we're in the motion as it stands is um, give, uh, empowering David Healy to include as much of the feasibility study in the application for NBRC as he deems necessary. So Michael, how would you uh, update okay, that? So I, the amendment would be that David Healy will recommend to the chair the portions of the feasibility study he believes are required. The chair will make the decision and will re and if if the chair has any question about it, will refer to the project team for consultation. Okay, I heard a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, that was second by Siobhan. All right, any further discussion on the amendment? Okay, I'm gonna unmute Phil and hopefully not get the feedback again, Siobhan. I just wanted to say that I think you and David understand the board's concerns as relates to the feasibility study and the public stuff well enough that I don't think there's a lot of question or conflict gonna be going on around here. So I believe that this should be okay and that you are capable of enacting the will of the board because you know what we've said. Do you feel comfortable with okay. that? I, I, I do. I, I just, uh, when somebody says you have ultimate authority, you know, that's not, uh, that's not, not something that's true or desirable. <laughs> just saying. Okay. Any further discussion of the amendment? Okay. So let's do the, uh, let's do the unanimous consent here. Uh, does anyone have any objections that, and would require a roll call vote? For this amendment, speak now. We'll give you a moment or two to unmute if you have such concerns. Okay, hearing no objections, I will assume that that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. So we're back to the motion as amended. Uh, any further discussion on the motion as amended? Hearing no more, I will entertain any objections to it passing unanimously. If you have any reason that you would want to have this be a roll call vote, please speak now. Give you a moment. Hearing no objections, I'll assume that the motion passes unanimously. Uh, okay. Thanks, everybody. Uh, anything else on? Um, all right. So, what was that? That was actually still talking about public records, public records requests, right? Sorry to derail right. that one a little bit. No, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you did. That was very useful, and we were, and and we're still ahead of time. So we got to fill the space with something, right? <laughs> no, we don't. Okay. <laughs> It's still right, nice now. Some, <laughs> yeah, it still is. Um, so we have uh, two sets of minutes, one for April 28th and one for May 12th. Uh, any feedback on the minutes that Jeremy has submitted to us? So I'm going to go back and take a peek at those. Uh, let's see. See the draft May 12th meeting minutes. That, those were sent out May 13th. We'll just write the next day. Just gonna scan through these real quick. I would also just like to say giant kudos to Jeremy for getting these out as quickly as you've been getting them out. Thank you so much. It's really, really useful to see them while the meeting's still very fresh in mind. 
Yes, indeed. I'll second that. <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve them. <laughs> uh, for for both of them, or just or just one? Well, I'll do one at a time to be to be just to drive Jeremy crazy. Okay. All right. How do so I we have the stain in the in this process. You're giving me a uh, hand, you hand to David. Because <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, wanted... I wasn't at the twenty eighth, but I was on the at the twelfth. So I okay, can't this vote. This is the. Uh, so so let's just let's just do the twelfth. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. let's let's do the twelfth first. Then, uh, if you were if you want to abstain from the vote on the twelfth because you weren't here, just just say that you're doing that right now, and we'll make sure that that gets included in the minutes. Did anyone second the motion to approve? Because David made the motion, and then who seconded? Second. There you go. <laughs> Ms. Mr. Robert, whose rules we're abiding by right now, is probably like rolling over in his grave for this terrible breach of protocol here. But I, I think we're, I think we're, we're going to be all right. Okay, so any further comments or discussion about uh, the May 12th, 2020 meeting minutes? Okay, any objections to approving them as they stand right now? Okay, this is your time to object. We can do a roll call vote if anyone is so inclined. Make sure you unmute yourself if you have comments. All right, not hearing any objections, I will assume that we have consensus and the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, on to the April 28th, 2020 meeting minutes. Those meeting minutes were sent out on later that night on the 28th. Bravo again. There was um, a revised copy sent out on May 13th. Oh, so I see. So include, included a couple of changes, uh, included the last name of Stan Williams at EC Fiber. So thank you for that, Chuck. Um, all right. So I don't really see anything leaping out of me except a, a couple of places where my name is spelled S-O-N, H-A-N-S-O-N, which Whatever you know who who they're talking about the the Swedish Jeremy Hansen perhaps. <laughs> uh, I think I spotted I will fix one it. mistake. Um, the section titled "Approval of April Fourteenth, Twenty Twenty Minutes." Uh, it says the motion was to table the approval of the minutes until the next board meeting on April twelfth, and I believe that should say May twelfth. Ah, okay. Let me. Just yes, you are correct. Okay. I have made that change on my PC. And I will fix uh, my misspelling of your name, Jeremy. I'm very sorry about that. Spelling is not one of my strong good. points, unfortunately. <laughs> it's all good. That's why we pay the big bucks. <laughs> all right. Okay. So, um, was there uh, anybody who was not at that April 28th meeting that you want to abstain? Is that you, Siobhan? At Orange abstains cur courteously. Okay. Any other abstentions from the 28th meeting minutes? Did anybody actually move approval of these yet? Not I will that move I that heard. approve the meeting minutes, aside from the uh, previously mentioned changes. Seconded. I have a second. Okay, seconded by Chuck. Thank you. All right. Any uh, any reason to do a roll call on this one? Speak now if you have objections. Unmute yourself if you need to. All right. Looks like we have unanimous approval on the April 28th minutes as well. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, wonderful. We are at the end of our agenda and we're going to be done a little bit early. Uh, so let's move to round table. I'm going to take executive privilege here and do my own round table first. Uh, first of all, I want to really, really, really emphasize 
um, my heartfelt thanks to David for the big lift. This, <laughs> this grant application gets us to construction. This is really, really, really big. So again, another round of applause to David. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't. I don't want the applause until we get the money. <laughs> well, okay. All right. All right. You still, still did the still. work. Yeah. Um, and the the PO box has been registered. Oh. I have the key. Jeremy has the other key. We are we are done with that. That is underway. Um, I have a email out to uh, the online fundraising site to find out how I can be made the uh, primary person. Uh, I talked to Becca. Um, our former clerk, and she has a bunch of mail that she is uh, remailing to me. So I'll be getting that soon, and we shall hopefully be able to go on from there. Did you have a question, what's, David? What's the PO box number? PO box is box three two five, or if you want to, if you want to be fancy, suite three two five. Very exciting. Um, Where? That's South Barry, Vermont. Zero five six seven zero. And uh, and 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 strangely enough, they there's an odd way of of addressing it. If they require an actual street address, what you yes. can do, even even though the street address does not exist in Southbury, you can use my address because my name right. is on the account. So you can say two zero four two zero four Borelli Farm Drive. Number 325, same thing, Southbury, Vermont, 05670. And the uh, the postal folks will make sure that it all goes into the right into the right box. Um, and I should say, Phil, if you're still on the on the line, you, you don't have a key. I only got two keys, but you are also as vice chair, you are an authorized um, pickup person. So you can go to that that branch and pick stuff up if you need to. Okay. I will run right down and check. No. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and if you if you don't know where it is, it's right it's right up the street from Hannaford in Barrytown. So not not terribly okay. far from there at all. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Next on the round table, uh, Siobhan. I I was just gonna thank David too because I know how long that stuff takes to write, and I just really appreciate it. Thanks. I'm done. All right, Alan. Yeah, I want to thank David for pushing us to go out and try and get letters of support from people. It's been the best thing that I've done because I've had people get so enthusiastic about what we're trying to accomplish. It's been great. It's really been affirming of the kind of work we're trying to do. So it's uh, it was a good task. Thank you. All right, uh, Andy. Yeah, same. Kudos to David. Um, that was it's a great great piece of work all around. And also, Jeremy's a great clerk. Just so he knows that. <laughs> Agree. Uh, Chuck. Nothing tonight. Okay, David. You're muted still. Yeah, I think I've said enough tonight. <laughs> okay. Thank Fair you. Enough. All right, Greg. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have to uh, triple uh, kudos to David. Thank you, immense amount of work, and uh, getting it in on time, managing. So you get the applause tonight. When we get the money, you get the bottle of gin. Yeah. <laughs> I'll yeah. chip in for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I will too. All right, uh, Jeremy. Uh, just going to continue on with the thanks, but also just wanted to say thanks to to Jeremy, Michael, everyone else who's been to all these meetings that we've been reporting on, because that also takes a lot of time and a lot of focus and attention and isn't the most pleasant thing to do. So anyways, thanks, everyone. All right, Jerry. I'll continue on with the thanks. And apart from that, nothing to add. Okay. Thanks, uh, Josh. Uh, same as everybody. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, nothing more to add other than that. Okay, uh, John. Also, have to thank uh, David. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> He's an alien to doing all this work. So, 
<laughs> Other than that, I don't have anything to add. Okay. Michael? Um, I'm going to give a couple pieces of information. Um, so the department um, wanted comments on their emergency broadband action plan. Um, they were due today. Um, I'm working on them. I'm not getting them in today, but they said they would still consider them tomorrow. So I'm going to keep writing them. Um, and um, the other thing is, um, this is sort of CV fiber news. I'm doing my best to get COVID-19 CARES Act money for this year to upgrade all Cloud Alliance towers to 25 megs or better for everybody. Um, and so that will be CV fiber territory and part of our overall plan until the fiber overbuilds it. Okay, uh, Phil? Um, yeah, following along, kudos to David, uh, great job. And just generally thanks to everyone for staying the course with this. Um, we've had some ups and downs over uh, the last couple of years, but we're uh, seeing some real possibilities. I won't say the end is in sight, but I'm just saying that you know the possibilities seem greater uh, every time we meet and have more information. So thank you to everyone. You're here. All right. So, um, and thank you for reminding me about that commentary, Michael. I, I sent in CV Fibers comments earlier today. I just forwarded it onto the rest of the board. I should have I should have CC'd the board when I did that. Um, so there you have it. And um, I move that we adjourn. Second. All right. David and let's. So you could certainly uh, hang out here if you want, but I will be turning the meeting off in just a couple seconds. So have a good night, everybody. Enjoy the weather. Well, yeah, actually everyone. kicks us all off. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. <laughs> bye. bye.